Hello, and welcome back to the mechanochemistry discussions. This seminar series is hosted by the NSF-funded Center for Mechanical Control of Chemistry, or the CMCC. I'm Ashley Martini. The goal of our seminar series is, as always, to bring our community together. The seminars stream live on the third Thursday of every month at 11 a.m. Eastern. They are also available to watch anytime on our YouTube channel. As you can see, we've had quite a few excellent speakers as part of the seminar series, and again, they're all available to watch on YouTube. We also have planned a few speakers in the upcoming months, and you ho we hope that you will join us for all of them. Before we get started, a great big thanks to a few folks, Dr. James Batiste, the Center Director, Jennifer Belsick, the Center's Administrative Coordinator, and two CMC students, CMCC students without whom the seminar would not happen, Quintarius Moore and Katie Floyd. Thank you so much ahead of time for joining us. Please do subscribe and follow us on YouTube to access all of the seminars and also follow us on Twitter. A few quick guidelines, a reminder that the seminar is being recorded. If you have any questions for the speaker, please either email them to us at cmccdiscussions at gmail.com or you can post them directly into the YouTube channel. Either way, they'll be propagated to the speaker at the end of the seminar and answered at that time. Finally, uh, with last, last but not least, it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Guillaume Debeau. Professor Debeau is a professor of organic chemistry and a Royal Society University Research Fellow at the University of Manchester. His work aims at controlling the reactivity of molecules under tension for application in synthetic chemistry, materials, and biology. He's the recipient of several awards and fellowships, including the Macro Group UK Young Research Medal and the Bob Hay Lectureship. He was awarded an ERC Consolidator Grant in 2022. Professor Debeau obtained his master and PhD degrees from the University of Louvain in Belgium. In 2009, he took a postdoctoral position to work on the assembly of mechanically linked block copolymers. In 2011, he joined the group of Professor David Lay, first in Edinburgh, then in Manchester, to work on the development of molecular machines. He started his independent career in January 2016 at the University of Manchester under the impulse of a research, research Royal Society University Research Fellowship. He was promoted to senior lecturer in 2021 and professor in 2022. Please join me in welcoming Professor Debeau. Right. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. It's great to be here. I'd like to thank uh, Ashley for the uh, introduction and for the invitation and Katie for taking care of this of this meeting. So it, and the whole CMCC team for, for the invitation. It's a real a pleasure for me to, to participate to this uh, seminar series. Um, I've seen there's a lot of you know fantastic speakers participate to that series before me. So I hope I can I can give you the same. Uh, level of, of science today. So I would like to, to tell you a few things about what we're interested um, in the group, which is mainly about controlling the reactivity of, of molecules um, and the tension. And this uh, this aspect of mechanochemistry is part of, of polymer mechanochemistry. And in fact, all of us, um, maybe people attending here or watching on YouTube, actually mechanochemists because anytime you slice bread for example or uh, open, open a, a chocolate bar you're going to uh, to tear the plastic wrap open you're going to break a covalent bond and when you do so you start you see uh, little cracks appearing and, and over time because the polymer chains composing this uh, material cannot really move uh, that much they will eventually break um, via covalent bond uh, scission. And so this is really where we're interested to make an impact. And so, you know, really studying this chemistry uh, to see how we can control um, this, this process. And potentially, if we understand how this works, we could um, implement some, some chemical uh, transformation or specific molecule that could potentially uh, either help to prevent this process or even uh, reverse it. And so that's basically one of the, one of the main uh, goals of of this field and so uh, if you try to do that first you have to understand how things works for these molecules under tension and the way to investigate that is to place a small molecule we call a mechanophore it's basically a mechanosensitive uh, molecule uh, inside a polymer and we use the polymer to stretch it uh, quite literally and and this uh, stretching this elongation will eventually trigger 
a chemical transformation, this being a, a scission or, or a rearrangement of some sort. And of course, like any chemical reaction, this transformation will be affected by the property, electronic properties of the substrate, the mechanophore. But uh, more importantly, maybe, especially for, for this kind of reaction, is, is the geometry. Because this will dictate how the force can then be transduced towards uh, the mechanophore. And because we use polymer to transfer this uh, elongation onto the substrate, the polymer itself uh, has uh, uh, an importance in the process and its composition or its architecture will play a major role on, on the force uh, transduction process. And so today we'd like to tell two um, stories about how we can control or use these effects to uh, control the reactivity of the molecules under tension. The first one, we look at how the geometry of a mechanophore can affect its reactivity. And then in the second part, I would like to tell you about our recent development into investigation of the topology of this structure and more specifically of the mechanochemistry of the mechanical bonds. And as we'll see in more detail later, mechanical bonds are this form of interlock uh, structure. As you can see, the two rings are interlocked here, or this ring is strapped on an axle, and this can play uh, a major role on the mechanical reactivity of these uh, structures and the, and the polymer. Um, so how we do that in the lab, uh, there's several ways to apply elongational force on a molecule. You can start at a single molecule uh, using, for example, AFM here, in which the, the tip goes literally fishing a polymer attached to the substrate. And as you pull the molecule away from the surface, you can trigger uh, chemical transformation due to the elongation, and you can use AFM to measure how much force you apply to the system. Um, in the lab, we can use sonar chemistry or even manual stretching, and on a larger scale, we can even look at a manufacturing type of process, such as extrusion showed here, or grinding, milling, that sort of thing. But um, in, in my lab, and all the examples I'm going to uh, show uh, you today, are uh, using sonar chemistry for the activation. Um, and this is a typical setup where you have a high intensity ultrasound probe here, which is dipped into a dilute solution of your polymer, placed in a, in a sous-slick cell. So basically a, a glass tube with little arms as you can see here to take a sample or, or have a gas inlet connected to it. And the whole thing is kept cool because uh, these uh, sonicator are quite powerful so it can potentially heat uh, very quickly. And as you apply the um, uh, the ultrasounds, basically the, the tip of this uh, probe um, uh, vibrates and induce uh, cavitation. So basically the pressure waves sent by the tip enter in resonance with the micrometer sized bubble in solution. And this makes this bubble grow um, uh, bigger and bigger and eventually they collapse. And when they collapse, all the surrounding solvent is sort of suck towards the collapsing bubble to fill the void left by the receding uh, bubble. But the solvent moves at different speed depending on the distance from the surface of that bubble. So this creates uh, a shear flow um, that expands away from the bubble in a gradient. So if you have a really long molecule, such as a polymer, one side can fill the gradient, a different gradient than the other side, and the result is a stretching of that molecule. And if that polymer is long enough, it can even break. Um, and it usually occurs in the central region of the chain. But be before it breaks, the polymer experiences a substantial amount of deformation, as you can see here, in terms of bond bending, bond stretching, rotation. And this uh, influence um, um, the reactivity of these bonds and can potentially lead to different type of chemistry that we would otherwise observe using thermal or, or photochemical activations, for example. And as a chemist, there's something really interesting in this process is the force propagates along a specific direction, which follows the main backbone of the polymer. So you have a certain element of predictability in how the force is applied to the, to the molecule. And secondly, you can see that the, the force is at the highest uh, in the central region of the polymer. And so this basically dictates how uh, 
um, we go about investigating this molecule because we will usually place the molecule of interest, the mechanophore, uh, in the central region of the polymer. And the way to think about how we can use this mechanical force to promote um, specific transformation is to look at the transformation we want to uh, to operate. And for example, here in this Dilsader reaction, uh, a retro Dilsader reaction, sorry, which um, in which the adduct dissociate along this uh, two C side bond to regenerate the furid and the malamide, you can see that the transition state of the transformation looks like this. So if you apply a force along the main direction of these um, uh, two bonds in red here, you can expect some sort of acceleration of this process. So because this association and dissociation of these adducts occurs at really a relatively low temperature, it's been actually a, a popular motif uh, in uh, self-healing materials, as, as uh, we'll see uh, later. And that's uh, one of the interests for us to start with this sort of other. So once we have a design, uh, what we do is then incorporate that into a polymer. Um, the typical way to do it, to ensure that this mechanophore is in the central region of the polymer, is simply to grow the polymer from the mechanophore. And in this case, it's initiated from these two alpha bromo uh, ester you see here using a radical um, polymerization mechanism to obtain that sort of structure. In this case, using um, an acrylate, so to obtain a polymethyl acrylate structure. But before we go about synthesizing and uh, sonicating this, uh, this polymer, we can simulate this elongational process using a computational technique called a constraint geometry uh, simulates external force. Codjeff uh, in short, introduced by Bayer uh, in the early 2000s. And it's a very simple technique in which um, we constrain the distance between the two terminal uh, carbon atoms here of this model. You can see it's very similar to the polymer, but the whole chain has been simply replaced by this uh, CH3 unit. And so you constrain the distance, minimize the energy using um, the DFT technique, and then slightly increase this distance, minimize the energy, and so on. And so if you keep repeating that for many increments, you get this um, energy elongation curve which brings us two very important information. First, qualitatively, it tells you about the most uh, likely sessile bond. And so in this particular case, it predicts the regeneration of the malamide and furin, which is expected from a retro addition process. And the second thing it gives you is the slope here at the top of the curve, give you the maximal force this molecule can sustain. And so you can use that number to compare different mechanophores uh, between them in terms of reactivity. And so once we have assessed the reactivity of um, our design by this computational technique, then we uh, get to synthesize it and then sonicate. And this is the example. We sonicate a 60K, a 60 kilodalton uh, in molecular weight polymer using the sequence of ultrasounds. Again, uh, to keep it cool, we, we uh, use an ice bath and we have this uh, sequence in one off, two, uh, one second on, two second off, again, to control the um, overall temperature of the system. Um, and as you cleave this polymer in two, you should have two dotted chains of similar molecular weight, which is about half the initial molecular weight. And so you can monitor that reaction using size exclusion chromatography, and you see this uh, initial peak disappearing over time as the daughter chain peaks appear at about half the molecular weight. And so this uh, two distribution uh, with this sort of neat um, uh, GPC profile indicates a non-random scission. So it's very likely to be mechanical in nature. But of course, that technique doesn't tell you anything about the actual chemical transformation taking place in this system. And so for that, we use uh, NMR uh, spectroscopy. <clears throat> in this particular example here, it's a slightly different uh, polymer in terms of length, but it's the exact same mechanophore. And you can see that after two hours of, of sonication here, we can see the emergence of diagnostic peaks corresponding to the malamide here, and the same uh, peak in the furan unit here and here along with a small amount of yet unreacted 
a starting mechanism. And so this confirms that the scission occurs as anticipated in the design and as predicted using the COGEF computational technique. And so most of the uh, system I will show you today, we have followed this uh, general methodology. Um, and as I mentioned uh, previously, we were interested in with this mechanism in particular, um, first because it's um, relatively simple to monitor, but also because it's been very popular in thermally mandible material in which is used as a sacrificial uh, covalent crosslink um, that can absorb mechanical energy and cleave under fracture condition like here. But because as we've seen before, it's a thermally reversible system, it can reform over time with or without the help of uh, external thermal energy. And this was initially published in, in 2002 by Woodall. And so we thought most of these examples here always use the same uh, sort of product. And we thought, could we control and finely tune the rate of, of dissociation of these adducts playing with the, uh, the geometry of the adduct? And so when you synthesize this bicyclic structure, they always present themselves into two different isomers named exo and endo, uh, as exemplified by uh, the, the proton here at the ring junction. And this relates to the relative orientation of the rings, which are like this in the exo and, and in which they face each other in the uh, endo uh, isomer. Uh, and we have additionally introduced the proximal and distal isomer, which refer to the attachment point of the polymer here, which is either proximal to the ring junction or distal, in which case it's placed simply one bond further than the proximal adder. And this very little difference of one bond um, distance between these two attachment bonds actually induced a dramatic change in reactivity and you know, showing how <clears throat> mechanochemical reactivity can differ sometimes um, quite a lot, quite significantly from its thermal counterpart. So thermal, you would expect the endo isomer to react faster than the exo. And what we observe mechanically is that the proximal adducts actually open faster than the distal to the extent that the distal exo adduct is completely inert in the condition investigated. So it's, it's resistant to uh, elongation and forces. Um, and one way to um, uh, understand that qualitatively is to look at how these um, molecule behave under tension and how well the sessile bond align with the general direction of the force. And we see that in the three reactive adducts here at the top, we can see that the sessile bond here, shown in red, is well aligned with the general direction of the force. While in uh, the uh, distal exoadduct, which is inert in these conditions, we can see that the putative sessile bond is almost orthogonal to the general direction of the force. And so in this case, the coupling is very weak. It means that it's very difficult to elongate this bond if you're pulling in, in that direction. So this work was uh, initially um, um, published back in 2017, and it's the work of, of Richard Stevenson, who was a PhD student at the time. You now he's moved on to work in, in industry. Um, <clears throat> and so this uh, sort of started our investigation of um, the reactivity of molecule under tension uh, playing with the geometry. Um, and now I would like to move on to the second part of my talk, looking at uh, the different topology uh, and, and more specifically looking at these, these mechanical bonds. So if you're not familiar with mechanical bonds, these are the two uh, simplest and more uh, most common form of uh, interlock structure. We have the catenin coming from the Latin catena, meaning chain. This is simply two rings interlocked with each other. Uh, you can have more rings, but this is the simplest form. And in rotaxane, which comes from rotation and axis, you have a, a macrocycle trapped on a dumbbell-shaped axis. So the beauty of this molecule is that these two uh, subcomponents are not linked covalently with each other. And yet, it's impossible to dissociate them from each other without breaking a covalent bond. So they are really true uh, molecule. And the <clears throat> interesting thing about them 
it, because of that fact, they, it, they are very dynamic structure. So unless there is some specific non-covalent interaction preventing that these uh, two subcomponents can move along each other freely, for example, here the ring can rotate along the other, uh, similarly, this ring can rotate along the axis or shuttle back and forth along the axis or animated with uh, Bourbon and motion, so the thermal uh, ambient thermal energy. Um, and these dynamic properties have been instrumental in the development of, of molecular machines. And maybe uh, more interesting for us today um, for the development of, of sliding uh, materials in which uh, uh, a network is built using a mobile crosslink. So you see this ring here, I used as mobile crosslink to assemble a network. And because these cross crosslink are mobile, they are very good at absorbing um, uh, mechanical energy in a rope and, and pulley kind of system to simplify. And, and once the pressure is released, they can easily relax again due to the dynamic properties of the system. Um, and <clears throat> uh, of course, now if we want to apply force to, to the system, we can imagine that we could induce the same sort of mechanical motion um, to elongate or bend these molecules. So if you start to pull on these two rings here, you're going to have a sort of reorientation of the ring to adopt a more linear fashion. Similarly, you can imagine pulling the macro cycle over to the stopper. But if you keep pulling, inevitably you'd have to break a covalent bond. Because you remember I mentioned that these subcomponents um, are forming a, a, a kind of, of chemical bonds that we call mechanical bonds because they are mechanically linked, but not covalently linked. And yet you'd need to cleave a covalent bond to separate them. So inevitably, if we try to cleave them, we'd have to break a covalent bond. And so the question arises to know how this molecule could potentially break. So you could imagine in the catenin that breaking a bond in the microcycle could effectively liberate uh, these two rings from each other. While in the rataxane, two possibilities arise. Either we cleave a bond in the ring uh, in a process we call unclipping, which is the reverse of the clipping strategy that could be used to assemble them, um, or break a bond in the axle, and in which case we would call that unstoppering as removing the stopper uh, here. <clears throat> so that is the first uh, question. The second question is to know what is the influence of um, the mechanical entanglement on the strength of the constituting covalent bonds in, in the process, in the uh, system. Um, so to put that in other words, is the strength of this covalent bond here in the axle of this hypothetical rotaxid weaker or stronger than the exact same bond in this non-interlocked axle? Um, and we have reasons to think that they might be quite different because if we refer to this analysis from 20 years ago, looking at um, uh, knotted structures in, in polymer, of which we're going to talk a bit more uh, later, we can see that the stress distribution in this system is at the maximum here, where the chain composing this uh, seg segment here is exiting the loop formed by this uh, crossing here. And so you see this, <clears throat> chain going through um, the central region of, of this loop is not too dissimilar to the situation of the axle threaded in the cavity of a macrocycle in a rotaxi. And so to explore <clears throat> this, um, the reactivity of this structure, we decided to design this uh, rotaxi here, which is composed of a blue macrocycle, which is a cron eater, and it has a high affinity for the ammonium station we place here, and essentially was assembled by threading this macrocycle this way over this recognition motif because there's an affinity between the two, and then adding this bulky group we call the stopper in a range to form the final rotaxian unit. So it doesn't look like it's on this uh, 2D sort of drawing, but if you look at the 3D structure representing the volume of the atoms composing this 
uh, two different uh, structure. You can see how big the stopper here is compared to the cavity of the macrocycle. So there's, there's absolutely no way for this macrocycle to pass over this stopper. So it's completely blocked, completely trapped by this big stopper on this side. And this uh, is also uh, much bigger than the cavity of this macrocycle. <clears throat> so now if you apply force to that system, what we expect first is uh, the elongation of the rotaxin, that is to say that the macrocycle is going to be moved away from the binding station towards the stopper, as we can see here. And then eventually, um, there will be some sort of um, activation of one of these bonds, potentially in the axle, to regenerate uh, this side of the axle, the macrocycle, and release the stopper, which was initially placed at the terminal position of the rotaxin, right? <clears throat> now, if you remember, we talked about this adduct, so you wonder why this one doesn't cleave, and you might remember that this is specifically the distal exoadduct, which is mechanically inert, but we've choose to use it here because it's still thermally um, active, and so at the end of the reaction, we could use the thermal activation to dissociate this fragment to facilitate the analysis of the fragments of this reaction to pinpoint where exactly the uh, scission took place. And doing so, we were able to analyze all the fragments of um, this mechanochemical reaction. And we found these three different fragments as anticipated. Um, quite interestingly, we recover this side of the rotaxin without the central uh, chain here. Well, we've been able to demonstrate using different models that the cleavage occurs at bond uh, Y here, so at the C O bond, um, connecting here via homolytic scission, and that the radical generated subsequently rearranged to reform this and eliminate the central uh, linker. But <clears throat> what's interesting is to know we know that this rotaxin architecture can induce the scission of a bond inside the axle. So we know that unstoppering seems uh, favored over cleaving the macrocycle in this uh, system anyway. But the other question is to compare that to a non interlock structure, such as this one. And similarly to an interlock structure, but which is not under tension. So in this case, we pull from the axle here and from the macrocycle. In this case, we pull from both sides of the axle, but still on a rotaxin. And in this case, uh, similarly, we pull on both sides of the axle, which doesn't contain the microcycle. So the non-interlock uh, structure. You, we see that kinetically, the, this rotaxin feels faster than these two uh, control units here and here. Um, and to the extent that we cleave actually a different bond, so in these two uh, control system, we actually cleave a bond in the PMA, so in the polymer backbone, while as shown above here, uh, this rotaxin cleaves specifically at the uh, axle stopper uh, junction. And if we look at some Kojev calculation and more specifically um, at the uh, Emax, so the, the most, um, the highest energy point of the, um, energy elongation curve I showed you before, which is the most um, activated substrate before just before bond scission. We can see that there's a lot of, of deformation <clears throat> where the bond scission occurs. So this represents a lot of torsional and elongational stress, which is essentially induced by the bending of the axle here um, as it passes over the bottom of the macrocycle. So the macrocycle itself is able to induce a lot of stress in the axle region. Um, again, in a way not too dissimilar to what was predicted to occur in knot. So again, showing that the rotaxin actuator can really impart a, a very different reactivity by its ability to deform the chemical structure passing through um, the cavity of the macrocycle. <clears throat> Another interesting thing to notice is that the macrocycle itself is almost free of any deformation. You see all this, all this cyclic region is completely free, uh, completely green. So um, 
uh, with very, very low amount of deformation, except really at the contact point between these, these two regions of the rothaxin. And one hypothesis is that as the tension spread over the linear region here and here, it is split into two in the macro cycle. So you have a better uh, force distribution in this structure. So maybe we're leaving uh, the cyclic structure from, from too much tension. Uh, <clears throat> and to investigate that, and uh, starting from the principle that tension always follows the shortest pathway between the two attachment points, we can imagine that in a non-symmetrical macro cycle such as this one, tension should focus on the side of the system. But of course, in the completely symmetrical one, tension splits over the entire uh, cyclic structure. So of course, to achieve that, you have to specifically <clears throat> design and synthesize a system where the attachment points are perfectly symmetrical uh, and, and antipodal from each other uh, in the macro cycle. But of course, you can easily achieve that in a catenane because of the free rotation of these two different uh, macro cycle composing the system. The small macro cycle here, uh, if it's pulled away from the big one, will naturally rotate along the larger one until they find this sort of equilibrium position where um, all the linear sections are aligned with each other. And again, here we would expect the entire uh, catenated structure to be under much less torsional deformation, elongational deformation than the linear region. And so to probe that, we design and synthesize this word text in here, again, using our um, a sort of favorite mechanophore, this Dilsand adduct, and we have distinguished um, this adduct inside the big macrocycle, so the intracyclic adduct in orange, from the extracyclic adduct in blue. But you notice they, they are of the exact same geometry, so this is the proximal exoadduct, which is mechanically active. So, <clears throat> What we want to do in this experiment is compare the relative reactivity of two identical mechanophore in the cyclic or the linear region of a catenane. And of course, as before, we started with the Kojev calculation. And as predicted, you see uh, initially a an, an slight elongation of the system. You have a slight bump here corresponding to the dissociation of the uh, ammonium prone eater interaction, which is a very a low energy process. Um, and then at this point, you reach this sort of equilibrium position in which the catenane is sort of linearized uh, in respect to the to these two attachment points. And as you keep stretching, this is where you start deforming uh, the covalent bond composing the whole structure until you reach this high deformation point. And then the calculation predicts the only decision of the extra cyclic uh, adduct. And this is in fact exactly uh, what we observe experimentally, um, <clears throat> performing this reaction in the sonic heater in the similar condition uh, shown before, we only observe the uh, dissociation of this adduct. Again, confirming the high uh, selectivity of the process and showing how the catenin is completely able to um, act as a, as a force protecting group basically for the mechanophore placed inside the catenated structure. And so to get a better um, <clears throat> sort of feeling about how different these, the reactivity of these two adduct is, we can refer to the calculation, specifically looking at the elongation of this uh, C-side bond here in the intracyclic adduct, <clears throat> compared to the same C-side bond in the extracyclic adduct. And you see, the intracyclic system is has barely any elongation during um, the overall stretching of the catenin, while the extra cycling is is uh, uh, substantially activated and eventually uh, undergoes bond scission. So again, confirming the uh, protecting ability of the catenin. If you have a really um, a large, a similar large macrocycle, but <clears throat> where the two attachment points here and here are placed symmetrically in regards to uh, the macrocycle, we can see that we observe the same effect. So we still have a, a slight uh, 
um, activation of this bond, but which is substantially lower than the uh, extra cycling bond, and which again in this case is predicted to cleave uh, first. But now, if we attach this adduct much closer, like in this adducts, and we can see the pathway because between these two adducts is much shorter. So essentially, tension only develops along um, this section here and leaves the rest of the macrocycle completely free of any deformation. In this case, we can see that these two bonds are activated to the same extent. And so in this case, you should observe a sort of statistical uh, distribution set between the, the, the two mechanophores in terms of activation. Um, and so with uh, these two results, we can finally answer the question on how these molecules can break. And actually, in, in, in case of the rotaxin, it, it doesn't, at least specifically with the system we have investigated. But from what we know from the um, evolution of, of tension in the whole structure, we think this is a very um, you know, general uh, principle that has been observed by other groups, uh, from, by Steve Craig, for example, on, on a different catenin system. Right, the rotaxin, for the same reason that a microcyclic structure is much more um, resistant to tension, uh, the rotaxin expected to cleave uh, more favorably in the axle via a unstopping process. So in short, catenin are able to prevent the stress or act as force protecting group in rotaxin uh, the ability to induce stress and hence accelerate the dissociation of uh, bonds inside the axle of the rotaxin. So all these uh, work on the mechanical bond was done by um, Dr. Min Zhang who was a, a, a postdoctoral fellow in the group at the time. So now move on to take an independent position in China. Um, and finally, as a last topic of this talk, I would like to have a closer look at the knot. So we talked a lot about <clears throat> the um, computational studies that have been done back in 1999, the first time, and then uh, some additional studies in 2016 showing how a knotted structure could uh, cleave and the tension. And we have this really nice diagram showing the um, high stress region of, of the system. But this was never demonstrated with uh, knots at the molecular level anyway. And so we set out to, to do that. So why is it interesting to look at a knotted structure? One reason is that knots um, occur spontaneously uh, in polymer chain. And once a polymer reach a certain size, uh, the probability of finding a knot is really, really high uh, indeed. And <clears throat> the simplest knot you can form is the uh, overhand knot, which is basically an open uh, tree for knot. So that might be the simplest knot you might uh, form yourself uh, if, you, if you want to tie something. And uh, usually, basically, the folding occurs because the terminal part of the chain folds on itself. But these kind of knots, open knots, and very dynamic structures. And so they can easily diffuse along <clears throat> the backbone of the of the polymer chain, either by translocation. So you have reptation of the chain inside the, the knot. So it's, it's slowly diffusing along uh, the main axis. Or you can have what is called braiding, so expansion and, and contraction of this knot uh, and resulting you know in this motion and potentially uh, uh, as well as um, resulting as well in the diffusion along the axis. So the, the message is <clears throat> these structures are very dynamic. Okay, so if we want to investigate how <clears throat> them behave under tension, we must somehow be able to keep them into place at least until we are able to stretch them. Because if you remember, we talked about the sonication process that we like to use. This um this of course occurs in solution. Um, the chains and all not all the polymer chains in the solution are undergoing this uh, stretching process um, at any time. So so you need that not to stay there until it's been activated by the uh, collapsing bubble. And so the way we um, uh, found to uh, to keep that in place is to use a mechanical gate, a concept that was. Uh, introduced back in, in um, 2015, I think, um, by uh, Craig and Bulatov, if, if I remember correctly. Um, and basically, 
the principle is that you have a, a um, mechano mechanically labeled group here that uh, connect the two sides of the polymer here and then prevent the knot to be a dynamic, basically. Uh, it's kept in place. And of course, once you cleave this gate using force, the overhand knot is revealed. So the species we expect to observe in uh, forming spontaneously in polymer. And if um, the contraction occurs within the same elongation event as the gate opening, we should be able to observe the contraction of the knot until bond scission occurs somewhere potentially in the knotted structure. And so we design uh, this system here, which corresponds to this um, closed knot architecture with a gate at the top. You recognize that the gate is again our um, proximal exo uh, adduct of the furin malamide inside the mechanophore. And this is connected to a three foil uh, knot here, which was designed in the Lee group, also based in Manchester, who specialized in the synthesis of this uh, kind of structure, amongst other things. Uh, and this knot was initially assembled with a, a lanthanide template. Um, as we're going to uh, pull on the structure, we're going to activate the gate, open uh, the gate via a retro cycle addition to enable the ring, the knot contraction, and potentially a bond scission will occur in the system. So experimentally, what we observe is that scission occurs <clears throat> typically at the uh, carbon oxygen bond separating this naphthalene unit here with the ethene and glycol linkers we have across the structure. Um, but more interestingly, maybe, is the fact that the knot cleaves 2.6 times faster than the corresponding linear ligand. So if you take that exact same molecule, but unknotted, that molecule cleaves at, at a much, much slower rate. Um, and in fact, because the rate of degradation of this knotted structure is equal to the rate of scission of the gate itself, uh, it's, it suggests that the rate determining step of the process is the gate opening, meaning that the knot architecture is probably even more mechanically labile than what we observe here, especially considering the fact that the linear uh, ligand itself doesn't cleave in the ligand, but cleaves in the PMA. So it means that the difference in reactivity between this bond here in the knot and the exact same bond in the linear ligand is much greater than this number because we don't even observe the cleavage, uh, the activation of that bond in the linear structure. So to get uh, um, a better idea of how this uh, process takes place, you have to imagine that upon activation, we open the gate and we start to, to stretch the knot and we have simulated the overall elongation and contraction of the knot using uh, the same COGEF. This uh, first part is using molecular mechanics. <clears throat> and if you focus on the central region here, you can see how the uh, pulling of these chains here inside the cavity is getting progressively slower because the cavity is contracting as the knot is uh, stretched. And uh, to the extent that at some point, um, the chains cannot be, the, the knot cannot really be contracted further. So the cavity um, is so reduced that the chain uh, struggles to pass through. And, and as a consequence, you observe a lot of deformation in uh, the resulting knotted structure. And you see particularly here, the flanking aromatic, which are supposed to be flat uh, in the initial structure, are, are bent quite substantially out of shape. So to get a further insight of the bond dissociation itself, we took a reduced uh, system here. So from this point onwards, we, we take only maybe this, this part of the knot and we um, continue the calculation by DFT. So you can see here the shorter uh, model we use. And you see the starting uh, point here shows uh, quite a lot of deformation already. And if you keep stretching, you reach this high energy point here, which is followed by the scission of the uh, bond here. So you see the carbon oxygen bond, which was previously linked here. Um, and 
uh, on this structure, you can see uh, the, the bond uh, A is cleaved um, and the uh, dissociation occurs at a really low force of 2.9 nanonewton calculated from this uh, Kochev uh, curve here, which is much lower to the gate uh, we use, which is uh, predicted at 3.7 nanonewton. And in fact, this value of 2.9 is, is, is uh, in, amongst the lowest covalent mechanophore described today. So it's really a really activated system. Um, and this is further exemplified by um, the elongation of bond A. You can see how much this bond elongates um, yeah, here as you keep contracting. <clears throat> and also uh, this deformation experienced by the chain as it exits the, the loop here is not only elongation, but also torsional. As you can see, bond alpha, which represents this angle here, is opening dramatically uh, as the elongation of the knot uh, uh, continues until uh, dissociation. And again, further confirming um, the influence of this region here as the uh, chain exits the loop in this, in this calculation. And so <clears throat> what is um, truly remarkable with this uh, observation is that the development of this stress region and the sessile point observed in this knot at the molecular level is also observed at the microscopic level and even at the macroscopic level, in this case, in a, in a cooked spaghetti, which seems like a, a bit of a weird uh, model, but um, if you read this uh, very insightful paper, because that's a very... A simple model to, to visualize. But you can see that the same knot cleaves in the same way at different scales, despite the fact that the molecule, of course, experiences very, very different environment than any macroscopic object you can uh, come across. But if you tie your knot yourself and try to break the string you've tied in, in a tree for a knot, you'll see that it will inevitably cleave at the same position where the uh, loop, the chain exits the loop. Here at the entrance of the node, this is what we observe here. This is what we observe here, and this this is what was observed with actin filaments um, at the micro uh, level. So again, the knot topology uh, is at the origin of the mechanical behavior of this entity, no matter what they made from and what scale they they uh, this force is is applied to. So it's a truly interesting properties, uh, property of, of this uh, topology. And so um, having said that, we can conclude that we have we had a glimpse um, of the different mechanochemical behavior of this different topology, showing that the catenin is very good at resisting tension, so acting as a force protecting group, like um, unlike the other interlock structures such as the rotaxin or the knot, which impart um, specific bending and, and deformation that ultimately leads to a faster activation of the constituting covalent bond compared to the linear counterpart. So I hope that with these uh, few examples, I've been uh, able to convince you that we can control the reactivity of these molecules on the tension using a geometry or the topology. Um, we have also explored uh, things I, I didn't talk about, looking at uh, substituent and multiple dissociation pathway. We have uh, some activity in mechanochromism as well, so we have a reference here uh, if you are interested. Of course, I didn't do that uh, by myself, so I would like to thank all my group for the fantastic work they do uh, every day. Uh, they've uh, really done a fantastic job with this uh, project and do some going at the minute, and of course, all of that is only possible um, with uh, the funding we receive from this agency. So we thank them for that, and as well as our collaborators, uh, uh, specifically here, the Lee Group, um, which um, collaborated we collaborated with on the on the NOT project. Uh, so if you're into that, you can follow us, uh, updates on the website or on Twitter, uh, if you like this sort of thing. I would like to thank again, the CMCC team for um, the invitation and, and 
giving me this opportunity to to tell you a bit about the research we do uh, here in Manchester, um, and I'd be happy to answer any question. Thank you so much. We have a few questions. All right, let's start with this one. Any thoughts on what kinds of electronic interactions might enhance the topological rotoxane effect? Uh, that is, electron donors in the macro cycle that are positioned to pull into the breaking axle bond. Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, we haven't really explored that. Um, there's certainly a possibility to have some sort of electronic interaction between the macro cycle uh, and the axon. Um, we haven't looked at that yet, but what we have looked at, we haven't shown that here, but um, different shape of macro cycle will also induce different kind of dissociation, uh, sometimes favoring uh, different process. So <clears throat> they always tend to break in similar ways, but the efficiency of the process is, is uh, somehow dependent. Uh, on the shape and, and size of the macro cycle, which makes sense in a way because, of course, the bending is, um, you know, dramatically influenced by the shape of, of the macro cycle, as we've seen. All right, thank you. Let's do another one on a related note. You mentioned pulling on different parts of the rotoxane, for example, pulling on the dumbbell inside versus pulling on the macro cycle and the dumbbell, et cetera. With a process like AFM, pulling on different parts makes sense. But how do you control which molecules you're pulling on with the material pulling on in the material with something like sonication? Um, well, the pulling point is really determined by where you attach the polymer. So the really the force is imparted by the polymer. So if you attach the polymer on the macrocycle, the macrocycle will be pulled. If you attach it on the stopper, it's going to pull on the stopper. So this is how we control which part of the rataxane is uh, is under tension by controlling the position, the attachment point of the of the polymer. All right, thank you very much. Um, all right, going back to earlier in the presentation, uh, you talked about the angle of the force vector with respect to the angle of the bond being broken. Can you quantitatively correlate the angle between these two vectors to reaction rate or reaction yield? That's a good question. Um, we've attempted to do that in um, in the paper we 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 published on the subject. Um, it kind of correlate, but it's it's not easy because there's just so many angles that are actually accessible to, um, you know, just physically accessible to explore. Um, and so I'm not quite sure the correlation we observe is necessarily significant for that reason, um, because we cannot access the sort of continuum of angle that would make that more, um, more convincing, I would say. All right, thank you. Uh, let's do just one more in the interest of time. Let's see. Um, let's go towards the end of the presentation. Are certain types of knots more common in traditional polymers? And how does studying these knots play a role in designing ways to alter the resulting materials? Yeah, so, so um, there's really a variety of knots that can form. The overhand knots we have shown is the most simple of all. And because of that, it's the most, by far the most common of them not forming uh, spontaneously. Um, interestingly, the strength of a knot depends on its complexity. And this is what they've shown in the Cook Spaghetti paper, actually. They've, um, they've looked at this thing experimentally as well as computationally. So they, they have knots on spaghetti and, and fishing rope of, of different complexity. Different complexity means additional crossing point in the knot. Um, the challenge of investigating that experimentally is to synthesize these knots. So we don't do that. That's that's a Lee group um, specialty. And But this is a very challenging um, aspect of, of the project. So it's theoretically possible, but um, yeah, uh, it, it's a synthetic challenge. 
All right, then let's wrap up right around there. Look, thanks. Uh, thank you again for the presentation. Thanks a lot for the invitation. Thank you, Dr. DeBeau, for that outstanding presentation. And thank you so much for joining us. Just a reminder that we've had an amazing group of speakers as part of the seminar series shown here. They're all available to watch anytime on the YouTube channel. We also have planned a great group of speakers in the upcoming months, and we hope that you will join us for all of them. Thank you again.